I just want to put a, a, a sort of note onto the end of the discussion that I had with regards to slavery. And, it, and, and the thing is, for 2,000 years, Christians have been fighting with varying different degrees of success against the slave trade. And they've done that because there's something about economic systems that push people towards slavery. It's poverty, essentially. It's a way of coping with poverty. Um, and then it obviously can get abused in power. So as, as, as Christians, we have to recognize as St. Augustine did, which is that slavery is an expression of the sinful world. That's why it keeps reappearing, even in modern Britain, where it's illegal to be a slave. Slavery has been outlawed here because of our Christian faith. And so as Christians, we have repented. It's time for the rest of the world to catch up with the Europeans. We are the ones that have abandoned slavery and the rest of the world needs to catch up with us. So stop being embarrassed and ashamed. The reality is that slavery still needs to be tackled in the Arab Islamic world. It needs to be tackled in the African Islamic world. It needs to be tackled in the Asian Islamic world. It needs to be tackled in the Hindu world and it needs to be tackled in the communist world. We don't need to take any lectures on slavery. We need to give them. Okay, I'm ready to do another one. Yep, okay. So, I just want to talk about a Christian economy. The Christian economy which goes, is connected to the idea of good works. The idea of um, preferring one another to ourselves. As it says in Romans 12 verse 10, love one another with a brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. As Christians, we have to have a different kind of culture in our fellowships, one that isn't built on self-interest. As Christians, we should be competing with one another to be a blessing to one another. That is the, the Christian economy, the Christian transaction uh, of discipleship. There should be competition between Christians in showing honor to one another, in, in helping one another and assisting one another. John 13, 34 states, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you also, or to love, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. This is when Christ washed the feet of his disciples. He washed the, defeat, the feet of his disciples to teach us that that is how we should serve and honor one another. In acts of service is how we do honor. Our Lord said that the greatest amongst you is the one who serves the others. This is the kind of Christian economy that as Christians we're meant to live by. We're not meant to live in a world where we seek to emulate and seek to, seek to, um, the, sorry, there's a bit of a, an argument developing in the background. It's a bit distracting, I'm keeping an eye on a brother. So um, we're meant to stand in, in an act of service to one another rather than being as the world does, where we prefer ourselves, where we have our entitlements, where we, where we seek to be have honoured and, and seek people to do things for us. As Christians within the church, we should seek to honour with one another and to serve one another in kindness. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. The church needs to have this attitude of deference to one another, this sense of meekness before one another, this sense of service of one another. Because our Lord said, for one another, the world shall know that the Father has sent me. In 1 Peter 4.8 it reads, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Yes, there's always faults in the fellowship, there's always failings in the fellowship, but if we keep our love on fire for one another, if we keep our sense of duty towards one another and our sense of humbleness before one another alive, we can get past those kinds of failures, those sins, those falling short of the glory of God, and to continue to act in service to one another. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, 
as God forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. Christians, if we have this kind of heart for one another, it opens up the idea of an interpenetration between Christians in our fellowships, in the way that we live with one another, in the way that we serve one another, in the way that we help one another, in the way that we stand with one another. Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. If you follow love, you fulfill the entirety of the law. That is what it means. That is what the Lord draws us to. There's no greater love than this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. And Christ said that we should love and serve one another. These statements, with the exception of the one about the neighbour, these statements are about the community, about how the community works amongst itself, helps itself, supports itself, is tender-hearted to itself eager to outdo one another in honour. Don't be eager to receive, be eager to give. Don't be eager to, um, to, to be lauded, eager to lord. And how does this express itself in the way that we practice? Let me give you some examples. Christians should not be the kind of people that are amongst one another, are seeking to assert their rights. Amongst one another, we should be seeking to assert our duties. That means that we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow ourselves to hear gossip. We shouldn't allow ourselves to dress immodestly. That we should greet one another as Christians. That we should be quick to want to serve when a brother is in need. Community that we don't have in our Sunday parishes. And the reason why we don't have them is because you can only live like this if you live close to one another, if you live life on top of one another. Galatians 5.13 reads, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So what needs do your brothers have? What needs do you have? What needs does your brother have? If your brother has a need, find a way to help it. If you have a skill that matches the need of a brother, let your skill meet their need. If there is a brother or a sister that is in trouble, stand with them, mourn with them. Stand with them through problems and pro troubles and persecution. Stand up for one another. But that also means you must be willing to receive. You must be humble enough to receive and not be proudful. If you have a need and a brother wants to meet your need and they can, don't resist it unless it's from a deep place of profound humility. Be open to allowing others to bless you. This is the kind of economy amongst Christians. Not of the way of the world, which is all about me. It is all about my fulfillment. It is all about my honour. It is all about my rights. That is the way of the world. It is not the way of the Christian. And if you are a non-Christian who is listening to this, answer yourselves, for yourselves, which of these two ways is a better way to live? The way of the world, which is about me, or the way of the Christian, which is, uh, it is about my brothers and sisters and how I can help them. 1 John 4, 7 reads, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. You need to love your brothers and sisters in Christ, and it is by that love the world will know that the Father has sent the Son. By the love that you have for one another is your witness, and that requires you to mesh your lives together to live a common life to be open to one another's blessings and to be eager to bless. I leave you with that thought, oh brothers and sisters. And finally, I leave you with this, my apologies. Philippians 2.3, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Christians, that is our economy. In the fellowships, that is our economy. To consider all our brothers and sisters more important than ourselves and because they are more important than ourselves, to give our lives to them. And if every Christian is living by this economy, 
Sooner or later, we will arrive at the kind of society that is attractive to those who live in a world that is all about me, 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 me. The choice is yours. Which do you want to live by? God bless. How you doing, bro? Um, JC comes in. Um, how we doing, bro? You all right? Don't let them get to you. They try to rile people here. When, when, when they make threats like one phone call and we're all dead, I don't take that lightly. Is that what you said? Yeah. Wow. I don't take that lightly. Tell the camera because people need to hear this. What happened? Uh, um, he said one phone call, we're all dead. Now, if you make a threat like that, yeah, you know, absolutely. There's certain people that are willing to stand and defend. Yeah, these beautiful souls that are out here yeah. today, and I'm one of them people. Yeah, yeah. Police officer, I hope you heard that. Like, there's a Muslim that's just gone round and threatened one phone call. And we're all dead. That's what he said. Okay. This is the kind of thing that we have to put up within the park, and this is why we need a muscular Christianity.